church. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I begin this morning, just a little housekeeping. I woke up this morning with a severe cold. And uh, so let's um, let's take care of the hospitality business. Um, if you could hold your hands out. Move them forward just a little bit. Lean forward. We've had our virtual hug for the day. <laughs> and that's about as much as I want to share with you. You okay, Kathy? I'm fine. You're good. Okay. Let's pray this morning, shall we? Gracious God, we recognize that when we acknowledge our weakness, you can grant us. When we acknowledge our need, our love, and our hope in you, amazing things can happen. Come, Holy Spirit, and do a fresh and new thing in this place today. Bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Might it be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. So I have a question for you today, and that question is simply this. I acknowledge that when I get to certain places in Scripture and I read certain things that seem to confuse me, that I don't quite understand, I have, in admission, a way of passing over those things, such as the text read today in my past. How is it that you come to the conclusion of who Jesus engages with in Legion today? How is it when you read chapters about Jesus driving out evil spirits, do you reconcile that in your own faith walk, in your own faith journey? Do you believe that there are evil and or troubled spirits amongst us? Or, do you reconcile this as Jesus is simply driving out a mental condition in the region? Or, there's a whole host of possibilities. The disciples saw something, never really understood it, they wrote it down. Never really knew what to do with the text of the stories where Jesus takes on and exercises evil spirits. And maybe part of that is because when I was a kid, The Exorcist was a popular movie. Mom didn't allow us to see, but we caught up to it later on. <laughs> that didn't have a lot of good images. As a pastor, seminaries very rarely talk about the topic of spiritual warfare. And so we're, in many cases, left to our own. And so I want to share with you a story from the last church I was in. Still not quite sure how to deal with texts like this or what to do with this whole question of possession, demon, you know, demon possession or what have you. So I'm at my last church. Start there. Um, preschool uh, is running very lively time, but when the summer comes, the secretary leaves at 2 o'clock. I have a lot of quiet time between 2 and 5 or however late I'm going to be there until the evening activities occur. And then that first summer there, we have a church mouse there, uh, Rick, who at times just can kind of appear before you. I don't know how the guy does it, but it's really freaky. He's quiet as a mouse. One day I'm in the office and I hear these noises of doors opening and closing and I'm thinking to myself, oh, you know, trustees are doing some work. And I wait for Rick to appear. He doesn't. I hear doors opening and closing. So, you know, I figure someone's roaming around the building. Maybe someone came in. I missed them and they're in need and, you know, I have no idea what's going on. So I go out and I walk around. I can't find anybody. Check all the doors of the building, they're locked. It's really strange, only one entrance in that comes right by my office. So this goes on for a little while. Every so often I get up and roam around the building over those weeks and I'm wondering. One, I want 
particular day, somewhere in the morning, someone came through a door and I heard that familiar door opening and closing. I thought to myself, oh yeah. So I headed into the office. The church secretary was still there, it was before lunch. I said to Marlisa, her secretary, all right, I got a strange thing to ask you. You got a minute? And her eyes kind of light up. She goes, always. Yeah. I said, I hear doors opening and closing when there's no one in the church and I can't find anyone. Has anyone else ever? And she started laughing. She goes, go on. I said, has anyone ever mentioned that? She goes, hmm. I think you've experienced Roger. I said, Roger? She goes, yes, that's the name I've given of this spirit that roams our church. The church was built in 76 and added on to in 2009. I'm like, okay, it's not like a building that's, you know, we have our own history, right? We chilled coffee with this topic. I said, well, what's going on? She goes, well, let me tell you. And she pulls out this file. She goes, um, we knew that she was getting ready to um, follow her husband in North Carolina for employment. So she said, well, I should tell you about this because someone's going to have to know and someone's going to have to carry this on, you know. But when we were putting this expansion on, the one that we worship in today, a guy showed up at our door. And he presented this elaborate case that people from his family generations ago who studied law somewhere were buried on this property. And he wanted us to hire a seismologist to come out and shoot radiation in the ground and find the location. Apparently there are 20 grave sites. 13 of them have, 12 or 13 have, remains in them from my ancestors who served in the Spanish-American War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. But we don't know where they're at because he believed or claimed that the farmer who sold the land to us, who lived right next to us, dug up the tombstones so he could farm over them. But there were no tombstones found. And then he generated and gave to us a large aerial photo of the property. And you could see a graveyard next to a tree. And this was his proof, and you know, that his family had owned this land, and such and such and such. And so he wanted us to do it, and construction was halted for a while. Well, we figured out what we were going to do, and we contacted the Marion Township trustees, you know, who would care for grave sites outside of this city proper. But they said they didn't want to have anything to do with mowing another piece of property here on your own. No one really kind of knew where this was. And the seismology was going to add $14,000 to our bill. So the trustees said, here, based on where this is located, this is where we think this is. The parking lot won't go that far. We'll, you know, they adjusted some slightly some of the building. There's a sign there now that says, in this area, there are these sites, but we don't know where. And the agreement was, if ever we wanted to expand further in that direction, that we would pay for the seismology. Is this good enough? Seemed to appease young man. He really wanted it done, and a fence put around it and protected it, and I get that, but it just wasn't enough. Marlisa said to me, I'll look at this photograph. I said, okay. She goes, I grew up in these fields as a girl. I roam in this area. The tree that they're referencing isn't that stump out back. It's actually over here where the mailbox is. There was a tree whose stump has long gone. I believe we've already paved over these graves. And I think a seismology report might show that we've disrupted and so Roger is ticked. She goes, I've actually seen him. He's actually appeared. One day, and it's only happened once when I was in the church, I was walking by the kitchen and I heard a noise and I turned and looked to my left and he walked right through the wall. The man was, I don't know, five foot tall in an old military uniform and he just stood there and looked at me. Blinked. And I blinked. I said, hello, and he never responded. And he just kind of was curious about me. I was real curious about him, and I turned around and I left. That's why I named him Roger. 
I said, who else knows about Roger? It's usually not a real popular thing in the church. She said, you're the fourth. Me, you, Pastor Steve, who was here before you, he experienced some of the things. That, and I believe a painter that we had hired to paint a mural on, on a wall was paid on an hourly basis. And he always had more work to do, more details to put on. They were shocked when the mural, when the mural over a year cost over $5,000 to paint. She said, I think he had an experience because one day he closed up his paint bucket and said, I'm done, you won't ever see me again, see you later, and he was gone. She goes, so I think Roger was a money saver. <laughs> <laughs> wow, my curiosity is piqued. I read this text, I think of this experience with this mysterious Roger. I'll show myself what we as people of faith to do with this. So I call a friend who was in the middle of writing his PhD on spiritual warfare. And he said to me, I gave you my book. It tells you what to do. I'm like, okay. I start talking to other pastors and I realize there's a lot of them that will say, okay, Joe, not going down that road. So what do I do with this? Necessary, not necessarily, in my mind, an evil spirit, but maybe a troubled spirit. And I go to scriptures and I read that each one of us has a spirit, that the spirit, the Holy Spirit, talks to our spirit. Right? And in doing so, we come to acknowledge God's existence, accept God, and submit. Turn over, right? Maybe this is a spirit that couldn't find its final resting place. Does this fall in my pastoral ministry? church and in this community. So I think about it and I pray about it. And I go back to this text. I took a class from this gentleman who was doing his PhD and has finished it now on spiritual warfare and writes books and all that kind of stuff. And he asked me, what do you do with this text? Is it fictional to you or not? Or is it literal? And if it's literal, how does that work? So I want to share a little bit of my spiritual journey. Not, don't take that the wrong way. Right? Faith journey. And my discovery of what I've come to. And I'm going to say that I think that we can engage in spiritual warfare. But it has to happen on a three-pronged approach and a three-pronged Each supersedes the next. And it starts how evil entered the world. You know the story, right? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, we lived in harmony as humanity with God. And as we did so, all was well. There's just one asterisk in the fine print of our contract. Just don't eat of the fruit of the tree of life in the center of the garden. If you don't do that, it'll all be good. But we're like little kids, right? A toddler has just been told, don't touch the hot stove. What's the hot stove? And we don't know how old they are, Adam and Eve, but we know that at some point they made the decision, ah, the old man is crazy. I can eat whatever I want. And in doing so, sin enters the world through our decision not to follow God's will. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Because if you do, I think we all recognize that there's times and places in our lives when we've said, oh, the old man is crazy. God the Father, I got a plan that's better. In whatever way we choose not to do God's will, sin enters into it. We are just as accountable to blame for our own demise. We don't have to blame Eve or Adam or anyone else. And so the time at which I think that I am in any way equal to the divine 
that the created could ever be anywhere close to the creator. But the times in which I don't want to give over and submit, I'm weakened. That's the idea behind sin. And my friend tells me, friends, anytime that someone is possessed, I find that there was a crack in weakness that allowed that spirit to come in. That either we aren't well mentally, physically, or spiritually. Hmm. So anytime I say, okay, God, <laughs> that's a good plan. We'll call that plan B. We're going to go with plan A. In my wicked state, I open the opportunity for sin to come in, for evil to come in. And I would even say, for even evil spirits and Satan to come in. So the first battle is a battle of the heart. Am I willing to allow God to drive the bus and for me to go on the ride? You can think of a carry on the word song like that, I'm sure. Right? Am I willing, or where am I unwilling, to give over portions, parts of my life, plans, hopes, dreams, the future? And at the point, I don't think that my God is a big enough God to handle, or I'm not big enough to handle the thing that God is telling me to do when I place it in God's care. First battle is a battle of heart. In allowing and giving over to what happened. Now, I go back to scripture. And I find that the second battle might be the battle of the head. Right? Legion is in an area no one wants to go. The crazy guy who lives over there, right? Jesus, if you look at the end of the fourth chapter of Mark, has just uh, calmed the storm of waters. Coming across Lake Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, whatever you want to call it. They come to a place where they're going to enter into worship and prayer, and Jesus finds legion, and then here's where he's at. The battle with legion begins, but look at the people's reaction. I don't want to be anywhere near this guy. Chains can't bind him, right? He's a madman. And the people's response when Jesus drives the spirits out is, be gone from us, right? And I often wondered about that. Man, someone that can heal in that way, wouldn't you want to kind of follow them? Well, one does in the story, but the rest don't want to have anything to do with them, because I think that they suspect as many scholars believe, that who can command evil spirits or demons? But Satan. So who is it I see as this Jesus guy? Who can command even the demons and they respond? Some may come to the conclusion he might be Satan himself, but Satan isn't in the work of reconciliation and healing. How do you battle that in your head? How do you understand who this guy is and what this person of Jesus can do for us? The disciples had the same challenge of head. Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter responds, the one. Is your God big enough to overcome the battles of the head? That's the second aspect. It's your willing, the heart is willing to give over. Are you willing to reasonably let go? Are you still holding on to your plan? Are you still hold on to what you think is best? Are you still hold on to the fact that if you finally get the American dream, right? A certain income, 2.5 kids. I don't know how the 0.5 kid worked out, but they'll figure that out. We live in, I think, a culture and a belief that when I get here, 
then I'll be happy. And we chase a belief in a system of what we call happiness that really doesn't ever bring anyone any happiness. So how did they, as disciples, continue to walk with Jesus after this one? The second battle is a battle of the head. Coming to an understanding that maybe this spiritual thing is available and it can happen. We can engage in spiritual warfare, scriptures tell us, <laughs> if we're willing to do so in the power of the one who in this day, in Jesus' day, stood right before. The disciples sent two by two into the villages, right? And they come back, wow. If we, you know, even we could drive out spirits and heal people in your name. And it happened. Wow. Their minds were. So back to Roger. I thought to myself, okay, what am I going to do with this? Once I came to a conclusion, all right, this might be a real thing. Can I do anything about it? So I remember the words of my friend. I gave you the book. So I opened this devotional. I'm reading through it one day. I come to the conclusion that we need to invoke the power of God in this situation. That we as pastors or people, we're all pastors, right? Caregivers of the world. That we can even help this troubled soul. We spent three hours walking the building. Let me tell you the essence of my prayer. First, in the power of Jesus Christ, I said, pray, might this spirit who is troubled find eternal rest. Might whatever is keeping this spirit or this soul here be released. And then I'm praying this prayer that Aaron left for me. And I prayer walk the building. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I walk outside. I walk around the graveyard, or at least where I thought it was, where it might be. I don't know. Praying this prayer, and then I came to a place where I had a sense of settledness in my soul. The next two plus years that I was there, I never heard a door open again. No one ever talked about Roger. Maybe he found his peace. A lot of pastors don't want to go here. It's not a real popular topic to tell people in your congregation, you know, we had a ghost. <laughs> Church attendance. Psh. You guys, it's great. We'll listen to you on the radio. You don't have to come in there. But I've had friends who I've told this story to who called me later on, who have experiences of troubled souls in places in which they're in ministry and don't know where to go, don't know what to do. I got a book. Here's what happened to me. So now, how do I wrap my head around this? The first fallacy is believing I did it. So a real key lesson to that is in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice when the disciples, Jesus is gone, even Peter and John are standing at the temple one morning early in the book of Acts. This man comes near them, or they walk by him, and he's lame. And Peter's prayer is, in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ, you are healed. But we don't do it. But we become agents of it. The battle of the heart makes it possible for us to engage in spiritual warfare. If we're in a good place, we're not subject. If we're strong in God, we're not subject to right The third place. The third way is the battle of the heart is won. The battle of the mind is won. And now the battle of the feet and the hands. That we 
like Jesus are called to go into the world. Into the places people won't go. Amongst the people we are uncomfortable with. The crazy ones. Who are hard to change. But just like Jesus, we and the apostles and the disciples that have walked before we are called to go. Where are the places that you're afraid to go? Who are the people who are in bondage? Troubled souls. Might we engage as Jesus did? in a battle for their hearts. Might we engage in ways to go and spread the good news? Remember, that's what the disciples were doing when they went into local villages two by two, spreading the good news. It's not about us. That our prayer is as we approach someone who might have a troubled soul, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, let this troubled soul have rest. Well, some frightening stuff happens when we do this, isn't it? There are people, their minds are going to be blown. But maybe it's the start, as it was for me, of a spiritual journey to discover a God who wants to reconcile all. Who wants to relieve, them, relieve us of the chains of addiction of the chains of guilt and shame for past mistakes and poor choices, of the shame from being chained to the I'll be happy when this We are chained to the past and those scripts that continue to run, you're no good, you can't overcome. We have the good news and we have the Things are good with our soul. But we recognize the battle before us. We can be a legion of doom when we call on the one who brought a legion of doom on the spirits that day. And we can be assured that the battle will be won. Revelation tells us that, does it not? see, uh, if nothing else, we can use a weapon of hope. Because Christians don't fear death. Christians know it's a transition to a place where we don't have to engage in that battle anymore. Christ stands as our victor. That's the good news. That's what we have to offer to the world. Would we be willing to go to those unpopular places, to lay all of our fears and our doubts aside, to share the good news that we have a God who is far greater, far mightier, who asked us, as he did Legion that name to that day, to name and to claim. And go on, that we can live free. Let's not fall into the trap thinking that we're doing this. Let us remember the start of every prayer into every ministry. For the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Right? If God is with us, who can be against? that we bring today. That's the light that we walk in. That's the hope that we have in our place in the kingdom and in the world. You know, on this journey, I figured out the old man isn't as crazy as I thought after all. Maybe it was me. Each week, as a reminder of God's will and wish for us, 
we offer the opportunity to come to the table once again. Would you pray with me this morning as we prepare our hearts? Gracious and holy God, in the unusual ways, in the uncomfortable ways, let us lay our lives, our future, our very being at your feet today. Refresh us as the well where your body was broken and your blood was shed. Empower us to be agents of change, to release the bonded, to restore the weak. It's in the power of your name. We pray that your spirit might come. Anoint these gifts which we take and all who receive it, that we might find healing wholeness until we sleep at your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to come forward this morning. Myself and the Stephen Minister will be up front if you are in need of prayer and reconciliation.